You're watching Euronews Now. Thanks for joining us. Let's take a look at the headlines this hour. London and Paris vow to do more to crack down on people smugglers after 27 migrants drown trying to cross the channel and reach the UK. It's back to tighter COVID-19 measures across Europe. Slovakia announces a new national lockdown and there are tougher restrictions on the unvaccinated as infections reach record highs. And Interpol has a new and highly controversial president. General Ahmed Nasser El Raisi of the UAE is facing accusations of torture and lawsuits in several countries. A search and rescue operation by French and British authorities continued long into the night after at least 27 migrants bound for the UK died when their boat sank in the English Channel. Among the victims were five women and a young girl. It is the biggest migration tragedy on the dangerous crossing to date. I want to say here that the first people responsible for this despicable situation are the smugglers. It is these smugglers that we must fight. More than 1,500 have been questioned, arrested since the 1st of January, and four smugglers today who we suspect may be directly linked to this passage of this makeshift boat have been arrested. London and Paris agreed to increase efforts to prevent crossings and stop the smugglers putting people's lives at risk. What this shows is that the gangs who uh, are sending people to sea in these dangerous craft will, will literally stop at nothing. But what I'm afraid it also shows is that uh, the operation that's being conducted by our friends on the, on the beaches, supported, as you know, with uh, £54 million from the, from the UK to, to help patrol the, the beaches, all the technical support that uh, we've, been given, uh, we've been giving, they haven't been enough. Our, our offer is to uh, increase our support, but also to, to, uh, to work together uh, with our partners. While the tragedy was unfolding, another 25 boats are reported to have attempted the same crossing. More than 25,700 people have made the dangerous journey to the UK in small boats this year, more than three times the total in 2020. French police and coast guards in Calais work through the night to try retrieve bodies lost at sea. It follows as at least 31 migrants bound for the UK died when their boat sank in the English Channel. It is the biggest migration tragedy on the dangerous crossing to date. Both the French and UK government have agreed to increase efforts to monitor channel crossings and to prevent disasters like this happening again. At sea, it was dramatic. There were bodies floating. It was very, very, very shocking. So we recovered all the people we saw on board. We recovered six people. All dead? Yeah, all dead, yes. There was a woman, unfortunately, a pregnant woman, and a young man, 18 or maybe 20 years old. The rest were men. Meanwhile, dozens came together to light candles and pay their respects to those who died. Many were also there to protest that France had not done enough to prevent this. It's serious. It makes me angry. It's not normal that things happen like that. And it's not normal that at a political level this is where we are today. It's not normal. It makes me angry. The protesters' anger seemed to be directed at French Interior Minister Gérard Darmanin. Darmanon insisted that France has worked hard to prevent crossings, quoting that 671 people were stopped trying to cross on Wednesday alone. Sweden's first ever female prime minister has resigned just hours after being confirmed in office. Magdalena Andersson stood down on Wednesday evening after she lost a budget vote and coalition partners, the Green Party, said they were pulling out of the government. Earlier in the day, Anderson, who was finance minister and leader of the Social Democratic Party, was approved as the new prime minister by a vote in parliament. Our reporter, Per Bergforce-Nyberg, has the latest from Stockholm. It was all smiles for Germany's traffic-like coalition as they assembled on the banks of the River Spree in Berlin 
After weeks of negotiations following September's general election, the Social Democrats, Greens and the Free Democratic Party will now jointly rule the European Union's most populous country. And after over 16 years of Angela Merkel's chancellorship, Olaf Scholz is Germany's new leader. We are united by the belief in the progress and in the fact that politics can achieve something good. We are united by the will to make the country better, to move it forward and to bring it together. We want to have confidence in ourselves when it comes to climate protection, restructuring our industry, modernizing the country and strengthening social cohesion. We want to dare to make more progress. With the Greens now taking a major role in government, the new coalition plans to hit ambitious climate goals, one being the commitment to the complete phasing out of coal by 2030. The fact that the cost of CO2 emissions per tonne is over 60 euros means that the coal exit will be brought forward. And now we have done the maths and can see that we are on the 1.5 degree path with this coalition agreement. Leader of the pro-business FDP party, Christian Littner, is set to become the new finance minister. We have set ourselves the goal of achieving this great transformation and at the same time maintaining prosperity, employment and freedom for the people. In what may be her final cabinet meeting as Chancellor, Angela Merkel received a bouquet of flowers from Schulz. Now the country enters a new era after more than a decade and a half of centre-right governance under Merkel. The deal has almost been sealed here in Germany. Reactions have been mixed, but by and large positive, especially on the plans to increase the minimum wage and also plans to build hundreds and th of thousands of new homes every year to try and at least ease Germany's housing shortage. Social welfare associations have, however, said that some chances have been missed in the deal. And there was criticism, too, from the Fridays for Future Movement and Greenpeace, who said that the deal doesn't go far enough to tackle climate change there has, however, been a lot of praise for plans to make adoption easier for non-heterosexual couples. And another big talking point here today has been plans to ease a citizenship and naturalisation process in Germany. On EU policy, the three parties have agreed to strengthen the EU's economic and monetary union. And the deal also points towards a readiness to reform the EU's fiscal rules. Now it's up to the three individual coalition parties to sign off on the deal, opening the way for Olaf Scholz to most likely be sworn in as the next German Chancellor and Angela Merkel's a successor about two weeks from now. But even then, the government won't get off to an easy start, with the shadow of the worsening COVID-19 situation here in Germany hanging over them. Kate Brady, Euronews, Berlin. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. It is what the family and friends of Ahmed Arbery had been hoping for. Guilty verdict for three white men who shot dead an African-American after chasing him in their pickup trucks. Travis McMichael, who shot Arbery, his father Gregory, and their neighbour William Bryan, took part in the chase, were all found guilty of murder. Mobile phone footage of Arbery running away proved to be a key piece of evidence. The 25-year-old was shot as he jogged through his local neighbourhood. The accused said they believed he resembled a suspect in a series of local burglaries. The jury in the city of Brunswick deliberated for less than 12 hours before convicting the three men on multiple counts of murder. It's been a long fight. It's been a hard fight. But God is good. Yes, he is. Early in, I never saw, I, to tell you the truth, I never saw this day back in 2020. Mm -hmm. I never thought this day would come. Let us say first and foremost, and let the word go forth all over the world yes. that a jury of 11 whites yes. and Come one on. black Come on. in the deep south Good God. stood up in the courtroom Come. and said that black lives do matter. Come on. The men face minimum sentences of life in prison. It is up to the judge to decide whether that comes with or without the possibility of parole. 
Daily life is getting tougher for the unvaccinated in many European countries and for the entire population in others. Evelyn Laverick has this report on the latest COVID-19 surge. Here we go again. Slovakia's government has now approved a two-week national lockdown amid a record surge of coronavirus infections. The measures that take effect on Friday will target all, both unvaccinated and vaccinated. Under the lockdown, people can leave their homes only for some specific reasons, such as buying food, going to work and school or getting jabbed. The unvaccinated will be required to get tested to go to work unless they've recovered from COVID-19. If such a hard lockdown is not effective, then this will be a phenomenon all over the world. Slovakia's actions are in line with warnings from the EU health agency, which is calling for urgent action from member states to avoid pressure on hospitals in December and January. Likewise, the Netherlands is to announce new COVID measures on Friday. It's just reported more than 23,700 new cases, the highest since the start of the pandemic. With the emphasis on pushing vaccination programmes, Italy has tightened the screws on people unwilling to take an anti-COVID shot. It is sharply restricting access to an array of services and making vaccines mandatory for a wider group of public sector workers. Prime Minister Mario Draghi justified his government's actions. We are seeing a very serious situation in our neighbouring countries. We are also seeing that our situation in Italy is slowly but steadily worsening. And even Portugal, with around 87% of its population already vaccinated, is pushing booster shots. The government's pledged to give a third COVID jab to a quarter of the population by the end of January to tackle the pandemic storm. Europe needs to face autocracy more proactively, says Bas Belarus's opposition leader. Svetlana Tienovskaya addressed MEPs in Strasbourg, where she also urged the bloc not to forget citizens and political prisoners in the country. The remarks come as the EU is moving forward with further sanctions, this time targeting air carriers and travel groups fueling Belarus's border crisis as well. We have to... Uh keep uh, consistency in um, uh, sanctioning policy, in assistance of uh, Belarusian people, you know, in be braver, the same as Belarusian people are. Don't be afraid to take strong decisions because it's the high time for them. There are still a lot of businesses uh, around the Europe that are collaborating with regime. Just uh, don't be ruled in your policy by, by money be ruled by values. On an interview with Euronews, Tienovskaya also stressed that Lukashenko's apparent move towards de-escalating the crisis isn't to be trusted. However, she believes it's time to move forward with humanitarian aid. Lukashenko and his regime doesn't need these people. He, he wanted to use them. Uh, he didn't expect that his blackmailing will not work, so he's cornered as well. So humanitarian mission has to be sent and this is time when I'm sure regime will accept this because he also wants to, to, to solve this problem but he doesn't have uh, uh, money for this. Belarus's autocratic leader Alexander Lukashenko said it is absolutely possible his forces helped migrant crossings but denied they were invited. For the EU the challenge remains to find a balance between protecting the bloc's external borders whilst avoiding a worsening humanitarian crisis. The General Assembly of Interpol has elected its new and highly controversial president. Member countries of the Global Policing Agency have chosen General Ahmed Nasir El Raisi, an Emirati official accused by some of torture. Al Raisi is the Inspector General at the United Arab Emirates Interior Ministry. Critics say he has overseen torture in that role. 
Sarah Green asked French MP Hubert Julien Laferriere about his thoughts on Interpol's new president. Uh, it's of course a, a strong disappointment, you know. Uh, uh, we, we were not very hopeful, but uh, because, you know, the fact that the president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, had not answered to uh, my two letters uh, that was uh, co-signed by, uh, uh, by um, about 30, yeah, more, more, more than 30 of my colleagues, you know, he, he didn't even answer. So we, we felt that the, the, the French government was a little bit embarrassed by, uh, by this letter that we, we, uh, we wrote to Emmanuel Macron. We also wrote to, uh, I wrote to uh, the, the minister, uh, Gérald Darmanin, who answered that there was not really proof against Ahmed al Haïsi, but if there was, etc. So we were not very uh, confident on the fact that uh, Ahmed al Haïsi wouldn't be elected, and he he was elected this morning. It's a strong disappointment because I think it's a very bad signal for Interpol uh, toward uh, toward the, the 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 defenders of uh, human rights. You know, he's accused. He's accused of acts of torture and, and repression. What sort of message does this give? Do you think Interpol can fulfill its world policing mission, mission with credibility? Uh, of course, because, you know, uh, Interpol, uh, the role of Interpol is, uh, is to, to, to track the, the, um, the criminals. So if you have a, a man who is sus suspected of crimes, uh, as as the chair of this organization, I think in terms of credibility, it's not very good for the organization, of course, you know. And, and, and the organization had already problems with the former uh, Chinese uh, president, you know, who was uh, captured by the, the Chinese government, put in jail. And now we have a man who is suspected of torture. As you said, there are, uh, there are uh, play, uh, complaints that, are, that have been filed against him in, in Paris, in 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 in, uh, in London, in in Istanbul, also. Uh, so I think it's a very very bad signal for for the organization. The United Arab Emirates uh, became the second uh, uh, contributor, financial contributor to the organization, and, and, and its role in the Gulf is more and more important. And France uh, sells a lot of uh, weapons to the to this country. So I'm afraid that uh, many countries of Europe and others didn't want to have a problem with this country and want to continue to sell our weapons and, and other things. Manchester City secured top spot in Group A of the Champions League after coming from behind to beat PSG 2-1. Kylian Mbappe opened the scoring, but their lead only lasted 13 minutes when Raheem Sterling equalised, scoring for the second game running. Gabriel Jesus then tucked away City's second, capping off a fine performance. PSG will still advance despite defeat. Meanwhile, in Group A's other game, RB Leipzig thumped Club Brugge 5-1 in Belgium. Liverpool made a five wins from five after beating Porto 2-0 at Anfield, while AC Milan left it late to beat Atletico away in Madrid. The result means the battle for second place will go down to the wire. In Group C, Ajax also made a five in a row with a 2-0 win at Besiktas. Dortmund, however, are in trouble after they lost 3-1 away to Sporting Lisbon. In Group D, Real Madrid and Inter are both through. FC Sharp unable to repeat an upset against Madrid this time around. They secured a Europa League spot. That's it for now, but stay with us as we bring you all the latest from across Europe and beyond. And you can also find more on our website euronews.com.